Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Mackenzie Dean with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled, enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. In about a week following the webinar, we'll be sending all registrants a copy of the presentation to the email you use to register. Please be patient as the post-webinar preparation of materials can take some time. It is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our panelists. Sheila Deach is Oracle Cloud Director and Finance Leader, focused on the Office Cloud Champion, for Treatment. Analytics Powerhouse and Automated Finance. Mary Kilmer is the Executive Director of Healthcare Oracle. Ms. Kilmer is an industry strategic expert with 40 years of experience as a clinician, hospital executive, and strategic consultant, directing Oracle's healthcare industry point of view for 10 plus years. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Sheila to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Mackenzie. So, hello. Today, we'd like to share with you what's next in financial reporting and more broadly, business analytics. Uh, we see great potential and power in the possibility of people and machines collaborating for this next evolution of collective intelligence. So as Mackenzie said, I'm Sheila Deach. I'm Executive Director of Oracle Cloud, and I'm a 20-year veteran of financial and reporting solutions. I'll start out with an overall assessment of the steps for data innovation. Then my colleague, Mary Kilmer, will apply those steps to healthcare specifically. At the end, I'll spend a few minutes demonstrating some of these concepts. Okay, we believe organizations shouldn't spend time assembling information. They should spend time taking advantage of that information. According to IDC, organizations that analyze all relevant data and deliver actionable information will vastly outpace their less analytic peers in productivity gains. So how do you do that? What are these steps toward data innovation? So step number one, automate business narratives. So often the need for clear narrative reporting is driven by regulation. The Financial Reporting Council published guidance on the strategic report, which encourages organizations to facilitate communication and engagement by publishing more relevant narrative reports. If we look at the purpose of this type of strategic report, it's to provide the stakeholders, whether shareholders, boards of directors, executives, communities, with a holistic and meaningful picture of the business model, strategy, development, performance, and future prospects. The guidance also encourages organizations to focus on the application of materiality to disclosures and to be innovative in the structure of the information, really to improve the clarity and conciseness of information. Data alone won't deliver this information, but commentary and narratives from the necessary key stakeholders is required to deliver on this requirement. So in summary, it's not just the numbers, but the marriage and the synthesis of the numbers and the words and the graphs and the charts that explain these numbers. So how can you simplify that commentary and that narrative? First of all, automate the process from authoring to collaboration, to commentary, to approval, and finally publishing. Improve the collaboration between constituents. Put control and auditability into the process and automate the capture of the numbers so that you can spend more time synthesizing the information. 
So many organizations use desktop tools like Excel or Access or Word to manage the process. And they spend their time downloading and then reconciling the data and then downloading again. And they use email for collaboration. So there's no real automation. There's no reliable control or audit. There's no true collaboration. So look for a solution that incorporates external reporting and narrative reporting in a single solution so that changes or updates in the external numbers are automatically reflected in the narrative reporting. So you have that single source of truth. Make sure that the collaboration is in there for authoring as well as for approvals and ultimately publishing. So the second item here is creating connected plans. So think about all the different ways that organizations plan and all of the tools that you use to plan. For example, you may be responsible for planning for people, for projects, for capital, for the operating expenses for your department. And when you plan for people, this impacts your existing headcount, your planned compensation changes and your headcount changes. Your people plan and the factors that go into it impact ongoing HR activities like hiring and raises, as well as flowing into the overall operating expenses. Now, when you plan for projects, there may be, um, there certainly are operating expense implications as well as capital implications. And capital plans impact cash flow and depreciation expense. And all of this information is flowing into the overall financial plans, whether that is the operating plan or cash flow or balance sheet. And how do assumption changes in one plan flow or impact those other areas? This is extremely challenging if your plans aren't connected to one another. So according to a McKinsey study, the quality of the connected process has the most impact on the overall quality of the connected plan. So look for a solution or a platform that unifies the entire planning, forecasting, and budgeting process across the spectrum of planning activities, like workforce, project, capital, financial, and strategic planning. Also incorporates scenario modeling as well as what if capabilities. And then finally, leverage the power of Excel integration to facilitate data capture and analysis. Don't just use Excel as the foundation. How many of you have planned or budgeted in that 50 or 150 column spreadsheet only to have someone change um, a cell or mess up a macro? Again, have connected plans across the process because connected plans mean connected reporting and connected visibility. So the third item here when we're looking at the opportunities when it comes to financial reporting and data innovation is to beautify your insights. So if you look at this, this graph here, if you will, in 1812, Napoleon marched to Moscow to, to conquer the city and 98% of his soldiers died. 50 years later, a French engineer, Charles Menard, wanted to remind his fellow citizens of the horrors of war. So joining together time and location and temperature, this simple visualization reminded us of the true costs of war. So why bother with data visualization? We process images or visuals faster than text. I think we've all heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. Navigating those enormous spreadsheets with dense data can be daunting and quite frankly frustrating for non-financial professionals. When well-designed, visualization can improve comprehension, retention, and improve decision making. And it's more than just a pretty picture. 
The visual analytics should be intuitive, interactive, and mobile accessible from smartphones, tablets, laptops, and desktops. They should also provide a mashup of different data sets to tell the story or paint the picture. So for example, supply chain with demographic information and temperature information, or financials with people information and procedure information. Now data visualization can also be somewhat daunting because we're not all graphic designers and it's easy to become overwhelmed by design. So here are some design guidelines for us non-designers. Um, use color to highlight important information. There's no need to go crazy with color. Guide your readers through a logical hierarchy. Again, there's 10 different things here, but I think if you look at that very bottom one, simplicity, keep it simple. Don't clutter it up with too much content. Make the content that's there meaningful and impactful. So number four on our list here is reduce the bias in decision making. So when we, um, this fourth step here of becoming a more data driven organization is actually embracing machine learning and adaptive intelligence to reduce decision bias. Machine learning isn't the scary black box it, one, it once was. Um, I would submit to you that the more engaging online experiences such as Pinterest have really mastered the art and science of putting machine learning into their products. You know, most folks don't recognize or realize the, the severity of decision biases. Um, too often we find evidence to support our position and don't look at the data with two eyes and an open, or an open perspective. And there's bias in every decision. So a couple of examples here, anchoring bias, relying on the first piece of information found, overestimating the importance of one piece of information, that bandwagon effect or groupthink, blind spot bias, choice supportive bias, so looking to or choosing to overlook evidence that is contrary to what you believe. Or the flip side, confirmation bias, listening only to information that confirms our preconceptions. Um, there's the ostrich effect, so ignoring negative symbol or signals. There's overconfidence or expert bias. There's selective perception of how we perceive the world and there's stereotyping. So all of this plays into decision biases. And again, we're encouraging you to reduce that bias in decision making. And to do that, you can take advantage of the new technology enabler. So again, according to McKinsey, machine learning is that new enabler. So it's based on algorithms that can learn from data over time. It's not this rule-based programming. So it's not just predictive, but it's also self-learning. So machine learning is everywhere, whether it's uh, in your personal life when you've got your personalized shopping or personalized entertainment, but it's also in the work environment. So things like what is the best item, what's the best replacement item in supply chain, things like predictive maintenance and looking at sensor information um, to determine uh, usage on a piece of equipment. It's also optimized payment terms for financials. So machine learning, whether it's work life or personal life, it's everywhere. Um, but we believe that the future is not just machine learning, but adaptive intelligence. So it's not artificial intelligence, it's this adaptive intelligence. So it's this marriage or this intersection of the people judgment as well as the machine automation. And number five on our data innovation, or again, becoming more um, strategic and seizing the opportunity of financial reporting is to build a data lab. So what we mean by building a data lab here is really to create um, a data lab or a data lake and to really simplify models. So according to Peter Norvig, who's a Google research director, 
simple models with less data is better than having elaborate models, or with more data, sorry. Simple models with lots of data is much better than elaborate models with a little bit of data. So again, when you're building this data lake or this data lab, again, this is different than this holistic data warehouse. It's really about being innovative, so building a system where you're looking for innovation and not just looking at the historical system of record information, but understanding and using the data's potential, enriching that data so that you can unlock insights and share the value. So an example of this is the National Health Service, also known as NHS, um, and they deliver healthcare to over 65 million citizens in the United Kingdom. So the NHS Business Services Authority provides centralized services to NHS employees, contractors, and patients. Um, they established a data analytics learning lab with the, goal to, with the goal of learning more from the large volumes of data they already had. And within three months of starting operations, they reworked the process for the European health insurance card applications to prevent fraud, and they used anomaly detection to find that fraudulent activity. Um, they analyzed text to measure employee satisfaction and engagement and linking that to time off sickness. And they ultimately showed value in a relatively short time. And they proved that the project to management and got backing to expand. Um, they have a long-term strategic goal of saving about 1.5 billion US over five years. So again, they started with some very specific use cases, and from that, were able to show success so that they could build upon that project. So again, imagine the possibilities here. When you have insights, when you have variables that are explained to you with science and not just purely with people, so that marriage of people as well as machine learning. Um, they have a context and you're able to rely on that context. So again, these five overall steps to data innovation automate those narratives, that marriage of numbers and words and graphs, have connected plans that all follow the same assumptions or have assumptions flow through and have numbers flow through, have beautiful insights, again, so being able to visually understand what's happening within your organization, a picture's worth a thousand words. Reduce bias and decision making by taking advantage of machine learning, that marriage of that automated machine learning along with people. And then build that data lab. Again, those, those simple models with lots of data so that you can have a large sample of information to start making decisions. So with that as our overall context, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Mary um, so that she can talk about this brighter future for data innovation and financial reporting, specifically for healthcare. So Mary, I'll advance the slide for you and uh, you can take over. Thanks, Sheila, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, as, as was mentioned, I'm Mary Kilmer. I'm the Executive Director for Healthcare for Oracle. 40 years in the industry as a clinician, hospital executive, consultant, uh, and worked work with Oracle over the past more than 10 years. You can turn to the next slide, Sheila. Having been in the industry for 40 years, seen lots of changes and lots of disruption, but I think we can all agree that there's been more changes and more disruption over the last several years. And even over the last 30 days, a number of things have changed or been announced or put in place that will affect your financial future and your reporting um, issues that you have. So just take a look at a couple of these. The individual mandate that was put into the tax plan has not been taken out, but the fines have been significantly reduced. So what does that mean for you? That means more people coming into your emergency room without insurance, more direct billing that you'll have to do directly to consumers. Uh, your risk pools will be affected because less young and healthy people will sign up for insurance. Processes and uh, legislation that had been in place are now changing. Bundled payments that 
that we see successfully being used by a number of providers are now being changed as well as now being made voluntary instead of mandatory. Prescription drug plan, uh, where 1.6 billion is being looked at to be taken out of it, there was a challenge by the American Hospital Association that was overturned and those cuts will go into place, affecting consumers and others with being able to pay for expensive drugs. The CHIP program, which we all know is so important for children and their families across the country, is now being used as a football going back and forth in this budget discussion and, and within, within Washington. Uh, there was some temporary money put in place, but many states are saying that it's not enough. And in fact, today may be uh, the first day where many run out of money. Now, what does that mean for us going forward? Obviously, investor organizations are taking a look and saying costs are rising and revenues dropping and reassessing the look for providers, especially non-for-profits going forward. Next slide. Sorry, Mary. That's okay. Um, so, so there's been a number of implementations of different processes and policies since high tech and the Affordable Care Act were put into place. Many organizations have invested in those, they're seeing results. But some of those things now are being taken back and as this article in Modern Healthcare references from January 11th being junked going forward. So what can you rely on? Where, where should you be looking as far as being able to manage your, your costs and your revenue? What does this mean for healthcare? Next slide. We all talk about moving from volume to value and being able to manage our costs and manage our clinical outcomes. But increasingly, payers and consumers are having greater leverage over providers because they need to see the costs and they need to see the prices and they need to see the, re the results of what we're doing as far as better access and better quality. Next slide. And as I referenced before, costs are rising higher than revenues. In, 19, in 2016, uh, An Moody analyzed 323 hospitals and found that expense growth was 7.2% higher than revenue gains going forward. These costs were a result of labor costs, pension costs, technology investments, growing pharmaceuticals, costs that are sunk costs that you can't get away from. So what do you do associated with it and how can financial reporting help you be more successful going forward? Next slide. I have the privilege of working with our hundreds and in fact thousands over the, over the globe of our financial customers at Oracle, our clients. Many see this as an opportunity. Many see this to stay the course about what's happening or not happening in Washington. Many see this as challenges and confusion as to what should they invest in, what processes should they be implementing going forward. But what we're clearly saying is that consolidation in every form is pervasive across our providers and payers. Many see the implementation of shared services as an opportunity to be able to do that. Is that something that you're looking at or investing in or have invested in to be able to reduce your costs? How do you grow or manage your revenue? And ultimately, when you look at risk, look at the population that you serve, does it, with this change with um, the mandate, is that going to affect you going forward? And what about these new entrants into the industry, whether it's CVS or Walgreens or specialized for-profit entities? How do you be able to show uh, more crystallization to consumers on your pricing? And how do you you know, create a more powerful contracting position with payers and with employers? Should you adopt new innovation and technologies who will then also attract new talent and also engagement? Next slide. So in working with our, um, our provider and payer customers, next slide, uh, what we're seeing is they're investing in a more holistic financial cloud and new technologies to be able to accomplish that. And what does this cloud include? It needs to have an open architecture and platform to be able to integrate to your clinical systems and other systems because it's, an, it's essential that you be able to marry all of that data, all of that information in one holistic look, that data lake that Sheila was referencing, with one single data model 
going forward across processes and functional areas. You have to be able to have data to, to do your productivity measures and to look at your outcomes. But where should that data live? Should it be in a thick or a thin GL? Should you have a data warehouse? Many organizations are looking at this and adopting new processes and procedures to be able to manage this data. But it's clear that in being able to do analytics, it has to be real time. Being able to look at things from last month or last year or even yesterday doesn't make sense in this constant changing world. And you have to be able to look at all of those data, not just financial, but how does financial impact your clinical and quality data? What about your research and your grants? What about your HCAT scores and your operational and financial data? As Sheila referenced, we're increasingly seeing progressive providers and payers adopting machine learning and pre using predictive analysis, bringing third-party data in to say, how do we compare? How do we contrast? How do we know what our consumers or our patients or our physicians, or what are those decisions that we need to make? Having technology that's smart, that gets to know you and get in you so that you can allow the technology, allow your applications and your, and your solutions to be able to do the heavy lifting for you and you can focus more on those exception-based issues. Having tools like a multi-dimensional do to go what if scenarios, what if we bought that physician practice? What if we didn't buy it? What would be the implications if, an, if a competitor did? What if we consolidated our revenues in different service lines? How do you make those decisions if you don't have the technology to really look at that crystal ball and say, what will happen if? Next slide. So we all know dashboards and we all know reports and they've been around for a long time. But dashboards should be more than just red and green and yellow. They need to be what you do on a functional basis. You need to be able to go into a system that's easy to use in a dashboard-like methodology so you can find the information and do your work. You need to be able to find those reports, maintain them, distribute them, personalize them with your personal information, not just from an executive level, but from a controller, from a manager, from a director, even an employee. And the technology needs to be able to do the work, the touchless processes. You should be on an exception base for having your, your AP in and being able to manage all of those invoices. You shouldn't have to have a spreadsheet to be able to check if, those, if the cash had come in. Allow the technology to be able to do the hard work for you. It's essential that you have the ability to be able to look at your cost, the true cost, and the true revenue associated with your book of business, down to the DRG, down to the physician practice, down to the service line, that includes all the costs. You need to be able to look at your organization across all of its service lines through the continuum of care, not just the acute care facility, but your SNF and your home health and your physician practices and the community organizations that you're bringing in. They can't be looked on a silo. The data can't live in a silo to be successful. And that's what we're seeing from our successful and innovative providers and payers that we work at with is really holistically looking at your organization and holistically looking at your data and having a holistic technology to be able to do that. And to embrace those disruptive technologies, the innovations that are changing the industry, bringing things in from other industries that make sense. Looking at blockchain, a series of processes in and of itself, bringing in that artificial intelligence or a chatbot, if you will, a chatbot is, is a Siri or Alexa type tool that you can talk to to say, tell me how much cash is on hand. Tell me where, we are, where our budget is real and actual for 4 Northwest or a cost center. It brings you that information instantaneously as well as real time without you having to sign in and sign off and go to your desktop. Mobile technology. We have to be able to have our technology, our financial applications, our reporting that starts our day. We pick up the phone that's sitting there next to our bedside, and then we go to our iPad with our coffee in the morning, and then our desktop, and then back to our phone, and then back to our iPad. It has to follow us. It has to follow the day. 
as well as adopting inherent best practices. We see organizations turning away from the paradigm of customization, of getting out of the business of IT and allowing new and modern and holistic technology to, to bring with it best practices that adopt and respect the uniqueness of healthcare, but also being strategic value from bringing knowledge from other industries as well. So we see providers and payers specifically across the US saying it doesn't matter what happens in Washington. We know what we need to do. We know we need to manage cost and quality and access across the population. We know we need to manage risk and we need to be innovators. We can't stay with what we have. We need to move forward to be successful and we're not waiting for Washington or any other legislation or anything else. We need to be focused on bringing science into clinical and financial information and having the data and the analytics to be able to do that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sheila and she's gonna show you uh, some technologies that help you do that. Great, so I am going to just take a moment here All right, so again, just to give you a visual of what this looks like, if Mary, would you confirm that you can see my, my desktop here? Yes, I can. Thank you. And so just a couple of things that I wanted to go through, a couple of just things I wanted to share with you. So one of the ideas for um, data innovation for financial reporting and seizing the opportunity was having connected plans. And so when you think about those different types of planning that I was referring to earlier, that whole idea that you might be planning for your workforce, you might be planning for your financials, for your projects, for your capital, those models might be very different models. And what I mean by models is when you're planning for workforce, the kind of information that's important to you, so things about headcount, things about compensation, looking at um, actual versus budget when it comes to the number of people or FTEs, as well as actual versus budget when it comes to the breakdown of compensation. Those are certainly all aspects that go into workforce planning, yet the aspects that go into project planning might be different. So while they're connected plans, they also have unique characteristics. So for example, if I'm interested and I'm responsible for planning for headcount, things like workforce assumptions, the assumptions that I use for planning workforce are different than the assumptions that I might use for planning a project. So having subject specific assumptions. So for workforce, uh, hours in a day, days in a week, hours in a shift, and then associating those assumptions with different pay grades, and associating those different pay grades with different sorts of uh, roles within your organization so that you can actually plan based on those workforce or those headcount specific assumptions, which are different, although completely associated with those assumptions that are related to financial planning. So when we're looking at financial planning, again, very visual here, when we're looking at different sorts of again, key metrics, but the assumptions that I use for financial planning, very different. Yet all of that information from the financial plan, from the workforce plan, from the project plan, all flow together. So having one place, one methodology, one way of doing that um, can help us get to a more holistic way of looking at planning and a more connected way of looking at planning. Now, when it comes to reporting, rather than having to dig for information or find the information that's important to you, what if that information could actually be delivered to you? So based on your role within the organization, what if you had, again, very visual, very easy, again, that whole idea of simplistic data visualization, 
what if you could have an easy way to look at all of the information important to your role within the organization? And what if that information could actually be cross subject area? So you'll notice in this example, I've got project related information, I have expense related information, I have supply chain and contract related information, as well as HR information and information that has nothing to do with my enterprise system, but it's more scorecard information. So admissions, length of stay, expenses as a percent of net revenue. I can see all of that in one central repository. So very easy way to get access to that information. And if I wanted to drill down and look at more detail, again, the ability to see more information about my organization. In this particular example, it's a, a comparing budget versus actual by department. Again, very visual, easy to understand information. Now, several times during my discussion of the four different ways to get to, or the four different steps to data innovation, I mentioned collaboration a couple of different times. And so to illustrate this, I just wanted to show my closed calendar here. And certainly, uh, as we think about financial reporting, the closed process comes into play. And in our vignette or our example here, you'll notice that one of my operations, my West Hospital, still shows a status of open. And so imagine having that collaborative capability right within the context of my application itself. So having the ability to see that conversation, that collaborative conversation, that collaborative conversation with embedded reports or discussion or attachments directly tied to the process that I'm doing. It's not separate. It's not something that is in email that's separate from what it is that I'm doing from a transactional perspective, from a process perspective, or that matter from a reporting perspective. But when we think about the closed process, the closed process is certainly more than just looking at whether something is open or not and having that collaboration. Um, the closed process is also actually scheduling and having that list of tasks or activities that are associated with the closed process. So the ability here to actually have that schedule. And as part of that schedule, being able to see what happens on which day, being able to have that Gantt chart or that critical path of what activities need to happen in which order. Having that list of activities that actually you need to perform, and certainly one of those activities that you need to perform is reporting and going directly from that task list for close to the actual activity. So reviewing my financial reports or reviewing my financial information. And in one central repository, in one central reporting center, having a variety of different types of reports. So you might have reports that are very visual in nature. So as I look at my analysis here, again, I've got different kinds of reports all within the same repository. But as I look at this revenue analysis here, being able to see very visually, very easy colors to understand, green, good, red, not so good. In this case, it looks very orange to me. Um, the more orange or the more red, the worse it is. So let me drill down to find out more information about what's going on. Again, very easy to analyze and get to the details of that information. Now, another way I might get to those same financial reports is directly from my springboard. And so if we return to that springboard to take a look at that, that common center for financial reporting, another type of report I might have might be that multi-dimensional sort of report. And when we look at this multi-dimensional sort of report, the ability to slice and dice it, to be able to look at the different facilities, to be able to look at the different lines of business or the different cost centers, to be able to flip the part of the organization that I'm looking at, to be able to drill down within that report 
to see more detailed information and in fact to be able to drill down all the way to the image of the transaction that created it. So again, having that visibility, that drill down from that um, summarized multidimensional report all the way back to the original transaction. And then lastly, that whole idea of having those narrative reports. So those narrative reports being that marriage of numbers and words and graphs and charts that really give you context and explanation of what's going on and why it's happening. Those explanations of the state of the organization. And being able as part of your overall solution to be able to actually manage who's responsible for all of those different sections of the report. Who's responsible for creating those? Who's responsible for authoring those and approving those? So that you're managing it as a holistic process to get that final output rather than piecemealing it together with Excel or with Word. So those were just some very simple highlights to just get you used to these concepts and see what those different steps um, and are with the whole financial reporting and how you can seize the opportunity for financial reporting. So with that, uh, Mackenzie, I'm going to turn it back to you. Do we have any questions that are already queued up for us? Great. Thank you, Sheila and Mary, for that fantastic presentation. We will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. Um, so it looks like the first question is, how does Oracle stay abreast with what is happening in Washington? Thanks, Mackenzie, that's a great question. Um, as I referenced before, this is Mary. As I referenced before, we have a significant number of providers and payers we work with on, on a regular basis who let us know what some of the challenges and things that they see. But in addition to that, we actually have a Washington-based uh, healthcare lobbyist who works with the committees on both sides and all of the different organizations within Washington and lets us know uh, on a monthly basis or daily if it's necessary, what's happening, what's the expectation, what's the landscape, where do we see it going? What do we see going away? So that group helps us understand and helps us take the temperature of Washington and what can we expect going forward. Great, thank you for that helpful response. Another audience member wants to know, how does Oracle work with its customers to continue to add new technologies to its financial system? Well, Sheila, I'll take this one first. Um, okay. We have, uh, over the course of, since I've been at Oracle for 16 years, you know, our middle name we always say is collaboration. And we are very privileged that we work with the largest independent user group of any similar vendor. Uh, HIUG, Healthcare Industry User Group, is a independent organization of over 500, or I'm sorry, 5,000 members who get together on a daily basis, uh, emailing each other with best practices and monthly calls and annual meetings. But when they work with us directly, they work with our development organization directly, both with our existing PeopleSoft and eBusiness solution and now with our cloud solution, so that we know exactly what it is that they're trying to accomplish, what we should be building into our portfolio, what enhancements we need to make, as well as we have strategic councils with HUG as well as customer advisory boards who not only talk about what they need for today to do the everyday business, but also where is the industry going and how do we make sure that we are ahead of bringing new technologies on board. So we work very closely with our customers. We work very closely with the industry to understand where we need to go, what we need to build out. We're very confident we can do everything you need to do today, but we also want to be strategic in where is the industry going and how do we make sure that we're bringing these new innovative technologies on board where it makes sense from a use case and healthcare basis. Sheila? Yeah, and so 
I'm going to answer it from a little bit different perspective here. Uh, when we look at the opportunities for not just financial reporting, but for financial transactions as well, and we look at the opportunities and the changes for regulations and innovations, let's face it, it's ever changing and it's more rapidly changing. And so because of this ever accelerating speed of change, we see cloud SaaS applications as being an enabler because with cloud applications, there are multiple releases per year. Um, so innovation, new capabilities are coming out multiple times per year. And so the reason I mention that is 80% of new functionality that goes into these multiple releases per year is customer driven. And where do we get these customer driven uh, innovations? Well, certainly from organizations like the HIUG that Mary mentioned, but more broadly from our broader customer cloud community. So there is a cloud or a customer cloud connect, which enables us to communicate with our customers. Um, it's industry agnostic. And I think what's important about it being industry agnostic is that it really allows organizations to look cross industry and take advantage of modern best practices that they might be getting from other industries. So certainly in healthcare, the whole idea of um, demand planning, supply and demand planning, which is very much more of a manufacturing distribution organization type of modern best practices, we, seen that, we see that gaining traction in healthcare. And so being able to take advantage of what our customers are asking for and what they require for um, their industries, we can see healthcare taking advantage of and we put that into our new releases. Fantastic, thank you both for expanding on that question. Another audience member wants to know, what are the parameters for using the location segment in Oracle? Um, and they noticed that one of the slides had North Africa listed as location. Michelle, thanks for that question. So this is Sheila and I'll answer that question. So when you think about the segmentation, so um, you think about the different aspects that you want to track about your healthcare organization. So whether you have multiple legal entities, multiple lines of business, multiple physical locations, multiple cost centers, think of that different segmentation. Um, that segmentation of how you financially want to track your business is configurable within Oracle. So we actually give you the ability from a financial perspective to have up to 30 segments, 25 characters a segment. Now to me, that, that's an awfully big segmentation. We see most customers using um, anywhere between eight and 12 pieces of that segmentation, but you actually define what that segmentation is. So as part of that, again, you can identify do you want to track location as part of your segmentation? And if you do, what are those different locations? So are they um, different buildings? Are they different states? Are they different geographies? What is the roll up of those? So maybe you want to have a segmentation that is by state and you want to have a roll up of all of the cities that roll up to that state. So lots of flexibility and how you want to define those segments, not just limited to location. So Rochelle, I hopefully that really answered helpful. your question. Yeah, I think that's really helpful um, for the audience to hear. Thank you, Sheila. So the next question is, how does this work with, work with or integrate with an EPIC EHR system? This is Mary, I'll take that. Um, we are very uh, privileged and, and excited about the fact that we've been working directly with Epic on building and mapping our tools with their EHR, CPOE, and ADT. Um, we have a longstanding relationship with Cerner and we're currently working with them as well. Uh, but with Epic, we are very pleased that we've had a um, co collaborative relationship on mapping our information and their, our processes with theirs, and we continue to work on that going forward. Great, thank you so much, Mary. 
So another audience member wants to know more about the implementation process, and more specifically, she's wondering how long does it take to implement this type of project across a healthcare organization? Well, well I think, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> well, I'll say something and then you can join in. Um, you know, you, you know the answer is going to be it depends. <laughs> Um, but uh, I will say that it is significantly less time for a cloud application than what you're used to for your legacy on-premise solution. Um, you know, we have healthcare organizations that have been able to implement their financials, uh, GL, AP, AR, in just a few months. Uh, it depends on if you're looking at, at changing those, those structures, changing your processes, also depends on change management and being able to adopt that. So, you know, I, I can't tell you exactly, but it's certainly much less than what you're used to. Sheila? It's also a different methodology. And again, I agree with Mary. It depends. It depends on scope. And it depends on whether you're simply trying to replicate what you do today and lift and shift and put it in a new system. And we know Gosh, many implementations over time have happened that way. I want a brand new system, but I want it to be exactly like my old system. And then you don't really get to, to seize the opportunity. And so we encourage um, customers when they're looking to impl implement this to think about four different things. Um, first of all, simplify processes. I think historically so many organizations have customized the heck out of their solutions because that's the way they used to do it, and the new system needs to do it the same way. Does it have to be that complicated? Can you simplify and take advantage of the modern best practices that are embedded within the solution? So simplify your processes and take advantage of what comes with the system itself. Um, second of all, standardize. So if you've got, I know healthcare is highly acquisitory, there's lots of mergers and acquisitions, so once you simplify that process, then standardize it across the organization. Centralize then. So again, another trend is this idea of shared services and having shared services center centers. So centralize different functions, for example, accounts payable or fixed asset accounting. Centralize those in as few a places as possible. And then automate and take advantage of automation capabilities within the solution. And again, the simplification, standardization, centralization, and automation, taking advantage of that methodology really, again, helps our customers get to value much more quickly than they traditionally have in the on-premises world. And can I add that, you know, this, this whole webinar, we've talked about consolidation. And, you know, in healthcare these days, you automatically start thinking about mergers, acquisitions, consolidations around affiliations, and even contractions or you know, divesting organizations. But consolidation is more than that. It's really taking your organization and pulling all of the information across all of the cost centers, across all of the entities, whether there was an acquisition, merger, or affiliation or not, and centralizing them as Sheila just re referenced of being able to see your entire entity and having no more silos of data. So consolidation is important in regards to your existing organizations, whether you acquire or merger or affiliate or divest or not. We're also seeing a significant amount of account reconciliation, being able to simplify those accounts and simplify what you do. So all consistent with what Sheila just referenced. I think that's really helpful to add, Mary, and thank you, Sheila, for your response as well. That is actually all the time that we have left for today. I want to thank Sheila and Mary for their excellent presentation and to our audience for participating today. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Thank you.